Good afternoon and welcome everybody to SharePoint 2013, Your Questions Answered, presented by Prescient. My name is Chris Chambers. I'm the Vice, Client, Vice President of Client Development here at Prescient. And with me on the line is Tamar El Shazli, our Vice President of Technology. Hi, good afternoon everyone. I'm Tamar El Shazli. I'm VP of Technology at uh, the SBI, which is the sister company of Prescient. And back to you, Chris. Thanks. So a uh, quick, uh, quick agenda for today, a little bit of about Prescient and uh, who we are, what we do, and how uh, SharePoint 2013 fits into the fold. Um, we will chat uh, today about installation versus implementation, and then we've got a host of SharePoint 2013 questions that uh, people have submitted, and we are more than happy to take more uh, from the people who are listening in. So to jump right into it, uh, quick about us, um, and uh, many of you who have attended uh, our webinars in the past know quite a bit about us, but uh, there's definitely a lot of newcomers on the line. Uh, we do tend to get a lot of people joining in when we throw up a topic like SharePoint. It seems to be a catalyzing topic uh, amongst users. Uh, there are lots of lovers, lots of haters, and lots of in-betweens. Um, quick note about Prescient, uh, we are world-leading intranet experts, uh, and uh, of course SharePoint being a portal in the intranet world, as well as the uh, website world. Uh, we've been around about 12 years, profitable company, um, and I throw the term world-renowned out there, not lightly either. Uh, we, we, do a web, we do webinars like this monthly where we get to hundreds of people on board. Uh, we have a global forum in New York every year, which uh, gets uh, quite a number of guests from around the world. Uh, we host that, and it will be our third year coming up this October. I think I've got a slide on that in a few seconds. We've done over 185 intranet projects. Um, when I say intranet projects, I mean like the full scoping, planning, analysis, and design, not just an implementation. Our clients include lots of 500, Fortune 500 companies, um, and we were uh, initially the first people to even define and study the social intranet. Uh, more on that in a little bit. Um, we're also now SharePoint experts. About two-thirds of our clients used share, use a SharePoint. Um, largely, our services uh, are conducted at technology agnostic, but there are some places where it helps to know if uh, the customer actually has SharePoint. So, we've got a technology team in place that's been using SharePoint for over 10 years. Uh, it is Tamar's team. They're highly experienced in best practices in minimizing total cost of ownership. Because yes, if it's not minimized, it can be an expensive prospect, as some of you probably realize. That's us. There's a couple of our clients. Um, the full gamut here. We have customers like Sodexo in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Literally 100,000 people in North America, 400,000 people worldwide, all the way down to uh, smaller banks we're working on right now on Harvard Business Publishing, which are literally a few hundred people. Um, I would suggest a single defining aspect of all of our clients, uh, much like yourselves probably, is that they understand the requirement for a highly functioning internal collaborative network that people can use and go to on a daily basis because they know they can find information there. It's a key part of their business process and everyone understands that and it helps drive the business forward. So that's kind of the key defining moment, whether you're a few hundred or a few hundred thousand people in your organization. Uh, that's uh, kind of what we are. We were. Um, the first to define and study the social internet. Uh, we publish a report every year where we go out to thousands of people and organizations that range from, again, a few hundred to a few hundred thousand. We get their thoughts and opinions. We will uh, we publish it every single year. It's available on our website. Um, it, it really kind of gives you a state of the social internet and lets you kind of gauge how your company is fitting in. Uh, are you behind? Are you implementing the right things? What are other people doing? What are best practices? What's the new stuff that's out there? Those types of ideas and concepts in the social intranet report. Again, available on our website. Uh, as I mentioned before, we do run a yearly intranet global forum uh, this year coming up, October 24th and 25th, and we've got some great speakers lined up. Uh, we, we pull it, uh, it's held in the middle of New York City downtown at Pfizer headquarters. Um, a great fun, good location for people. Like I said, we get people coming in from Europe. We've had people coming from South America, all across North America. Um, and that's uh, so. If you can uh, come on down and attend with that, I think you'll uh, you'll really enjoy yourself. Some great speakers and lots of information about intranets in general. Uh, and of course, presentdigital.com. If you visit, there's hundreds of articles, white papers, reports, and videos, and uh, access to multiple social channels on presentdigital.com. Um, most importantly and relevant to this conversation is we, we really were the first people to uh, in the kind of devise this intranet methodology. As I said, this has uh, been around, the company's been around about 12 years, and right from the get-go, 
uh, Toby Ward, our CEO, recognized that people just, just were just installing a tool and throwing a few files out there, maybe collaborating a little bit, but it wasn't really, really hashed out. So put, he put together this assessment methodology, which we've, uh, we've been using ever since, uh, refined it uh, quite a bit over the years. But as you can see, uh, it goes through a full assessment, uh, which really uh, answers that question, where are we now? Where do we want to go? So we put in benchmarking, and then we answer those questions about where we want to go. This is all re very, very relevant to today's topic because a lot of the questions that we see here, uh, you know, some from the business side, some from the technical side, really had the work been done up front in these specific areas, uh, you, you'll see the question could have been answered very easily. So more on that when we get to that a little bit later. But again, that assessment phase, where are we now, where do we want to go, yeah, it's sort of uh, the analysis phase. Uh, the planning stage answers that big question, uh, how do we get there? So in other words, now I want to put together a plan um, or a functional plan. Uh, it includes such key areas as strategic planning, governance, uh, social media utilization, user experience, design, architecture, those types of things. So by the end of our planning phase and our typical methodology, now you've got to, now you know how to get there. Some of our clients bring us in for a technology audit uh, to make sure that their current uh, CMS or portal actually will suit their business requirements. Uh, and then, of course, the implementation phase itself, which is where we're going to spend the large majority of today talking. Uh, that's the key part. Um, uh, everything from architectural oversight to full implementations uh, is part of our methodology and available through Prescient now. And at the end of that, the tail end of that, we can typically help out with marketing, communications, and adoption and participation. Today's conversation, of course, is going to focus in on that piece of the puzzle, uh, the implementation, and specifically SharePoint 2013. As I did mention before, large chunks of that assessment and um, planning phases uh, can very easily be done technology agnostic. But when you know the technology you've got in place, uh, it kind of makes an awful lot of sense to actually plan with that in mind. In fact, it makes a great deal of sense. So if I pop back to that wheel and take a look at it, um, I guess the first thing I'd like to do is kind of clarify that installation versus implementation. You know, whether you're an organization that you just selected SharePoint for the first time, and we do see two types of organizations. Uh, it can be the type of organization where you've been selected for the first time and it's great, you're moving off of another platform, or it could have been handed down to you. Uh, so in other words, the, the IT department, uh, it's part of a, a global corporate strategy, you're, you're Microsoft, uh, right, Microsoft right through and through the organization, and you're going to have SharePoint no matter what. Either way, there's a huge difference between installation and implementation. Uh, and I'm sure you recognize that, uh, even from a technical point of view. Again, I've been uh, uh, sort of on the technical side, uh, more on the sales side now, but sort of on the technical side for about 25 odd years and used to install mainframe systems, so I'm kind of dating myself here, but I do understand what an installation is versus an, impl an implementation. I was doing systems in the, in the late 80s where we would walk in with reels of tapes and mount them on the computer, and that was fantastic. We would do the installation. Uh, and uh, but the implementation truly was done by accountants who could talk to the CFO. These were all uh, accounting systems back then, which is pretty much the only thing available. The implementation, of course, is done by the users, and, and that is a big differentiating factor. Anybody can install SharePoint, and that's what your IT team is going to do a wonderful job of. Uh, they will get the installation done. The implementation, however, goes back to have you assessed your requirements properly and have you planned on how you're going to do it. So that's really the key difference. That, that, that the installation is just exactly what it sounds like. It's a technical deployment of a product. If you don't know what you're going to use that product for and you haven't planned properly, it's still just a technical deployment and that's it. So there's my two cents on that. Um, I guess with that, we should probably jump into some of the questions we've got coming in. Um, we take a look at our first question. Um, and it's a my site question. When I sh and I'm going to... Uh, probably toss these over to Tamar, who I will ask to give a bit of his background before he actually, <laughs> so you can understand what who he is and what he does and how he joined the SharePoint, the uh, Prescient uh, team. Um, actually, why don't I do that first? Tamar, why don't you give a bit of your background and your, uh, your what you've done over the past bunch of years, just to a frame of reference for our audience. Sure. So um, prior to joining SBI and Prescient, I uh, worked for uh, uh, a bunch of uh, consulting companies such as Avanade and Accenture, and before that I worked for smaller companies. I've been working with SharePoint uh, since the, the inception of SharePoint, since 2001 or 2002. I uh, worked on uh, uh, many uh, projects, uh, varying from small projects to very large projects on SharePoint. 
uh, starting from 20, 2003, 2007, 2010, and finally 2015. Uh, we're also um, uh, part of uh, Microsoft VTS program, uh, which is basically um, a program where uh, they they sought out uh, experts in a, a specific areas such as SharePoint. Uh, we help out the uh, the team within Microsoft uh, and the clients, and also we uh, kind of connect with their product team on a regular basis as well. So that's uh, basically me in a nutshell. And with that, we can jump into uh, some questions that uh, you guys uh, sent us uh, our way. And thanks a lot for whoever sent us those questions. They're actually really good questions. And uh, in the meantime, if you guys have any questions during this webinar, uh, please feel free to submit your question. I think uh, there is a window in the uh, in in in, um, in Godo meeting where you can submit your questions. So please feel free to submit any question during the webinar. So uh, we'll start with uh, some questions here. There's a question about my site. So, so thanks, Tamar. I will. Uh, what I'll do is I'll prompt Tamar with the questions here. I'll read them off the page, and then uh, Tamar will take a look at them. Uh, and again, just to clarify, uh, Tamar is with a division of Prescience. Now we do SharePoint implementations. You've heard his background, and he's been working with SharePoint for over a dozen years now, quite a long time. So we, we feel he's a great guy to answer these questions. Um, first one, it falls in the category of my site. Uh, when I share my folder documents in our company SkyDrive with other team members, the only way they can access that folder is by always having to go to the message and click in the link. Uh, so the question is, how can they see it directly in their corporate SkyDrive account? Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Again, so um, you know, uh, uh, for those who know SharePoint uh, from from technical perspective, you probably already know that uh, my site is a big beast in SharePoint. Uh, in 2013, it hasn't changed a lot. It's actually there, there's some improvement in SharePoint 2013, but uh, it's almost the same as 2010. Now, in terms of the SkyDrive, SkyDrive Pro, actually, that's the proper name. Uh, so SkyDrive Pro is basically, uh, technically, it's a document library within your SharePoint, within my site, personal site, and uh, it has uh, it has special privileges or special permissions that you can set on. And when you share a document or you share a folder within the SkyDrive Pro, uh, you give access to other users uh, to that uh, document or library. Now, as the uh, person who asked the question mentioned, uh, there's, uh, the, the probably when you get the email, you can click on the link, you go to the, ship, the, to the SkyDrive Pro uh, folder or document. But now, if you want to access that folder document, there's no other way around it. In fact, it, out of the box, SharePoint does not offer any other way around it, but uh, there are different ways to access these uh, folders in document libraries. Uh, one of the ways is you can search uh, for uh, the person that uh, you know that shared that folder or document. And once you're there, you can access their profile, and then um, uh, and then you can go to their documents, which is basically the SkyDrive Pro. Again, there's some Naming convention discrepancy is SkyDrive Pro and with documents is actually the same thing. And then once you're there, you can see the folder or whatever uh, this person shared with you. Uh, so that's one way you can. Uh, in addition to that, um, you know, we uh, from from our implementation or from uh, some of the assets that we built up over the time, we do have uh, we do provide some uh, um, customization to SharePoint where you can just uh, bookmark any uh, any link uh, or any page on SharePoint, whether it's in my site or on the regular intranet, and. Uh, I guess we can actually show some screenshots if you want to uh, switch over to yeah this one. So this screenshot that you see right now, 
the first two, the one on the left and then the one on the right, that's basically how you can access the user's documents of the side drive. Uh, if I'm following this person, you can see the person right into the following uh, web part where you can click on the person's name and then once you're there, you click on documents. That's the out of the box way. Uh, the customization that we've done for SharePoint is we, keep, we added this uh, nice feature. It's, uh, it's on the lower uh, image in the slide uh, where you have a bookmark um, link uh, present in every page on the internet. If you want to bookmark the documents for Toby, for example, or the SkyDrive for whoever you want to have, uh, you want to bookmark for, you can just click on the bookmark and it will add it to your links. And then those links are persistent across the internet. Um, okay, so Chris, next question. All right, thanks, Tamara. That's a, a very thorough answer. Um, next question falls into that category of, of social. Um, what are some of the social features that are new with 2013 SharePoint uh, that are the most effective for internal communications? Um, before Tamara jumps into that, I, I will uh, I'll go back to that original preface that we had up here. If, we, if we've done our assessment and our planning properly, we, the most effective for internal communications are going to be the ones that actually meet your business requirements. So I'm going to assume that the person actually understands fully their business quest, their requirements, uh, who's asking this question. Uh, and there are definitely a whole host of more effective, uh, more effective uh, internal communications features. So why don't we head into those, Tamara? Yeah, sure. So I mean, again, like Chris mentioned, it, it really depends on how you plan the internet and um, uh, how, how, what features you uh, would like to add to the internet, what features you would like to have the users have access to. Um, in terms of SharePoint 2013 over 2010, so again, SharePoint 2013, one of the biggest uh, marketing points for SharePoint 2013 is the social aspect uh, that they've added to the new product. And, um, uh, for those of you who already who still have 2010 and um, have added some social aspects to 2010, you're probably very familiar with the products such as NewsGator and uh, similar products like NewsGator. Um, so what basically what NewsGator provides is a way for users to have a microblog to communicate very quickly with other users or other. Uh, and, you know, other uh, colleagues and so on. Newsfeed, which is basically a Twitter-like uh, functionality in SharePoint, where you can just you know say what you're working on, if you have a question, or if you're commenting on any uh, anything, any person, and so on. In addition to that, on these on the intranet sites themselves, like team sites and so on, you there's a new feature which is the feed, the site feed, uh, and that's basically um, a, a microblogging feed or newsfeed that gets added to any site, and then uh, users on that site with the right permissions obviously will contribute, well, you know, whatever they want. It could, it could be news, it could be uh, uh, media or videos and so on. And the good, the good thing is everything, uh, all that content is, uh, is um, indexed and available in the search. So lots of good stuff there. Um, one of the things that we leveraged uh, in SharePoint 2013 is customization or implementation on the intranet, um, and we've done that for a couple of uh, or a couple of uh, clients so far with Prescient. Uh, is the uh, you know, we capitalize on that feature, the news feed and uh, site feed, and we uh, created so somewhat. Uh, a conversational FAQ where you basically, uh, you know, you have an FAQ drop down, let's say, on the site or on the, at the top of uh, every page. And, uh, you know, once you access one of the FAQ, and you can see that on the slide right now, once you access the FAQ, it's, it's actually a, a discussion FAQ where yeah, it's not just a, a question and answer, 
but you can also see comments and if there's a follow-up question and maybe if someone wants to post um, like some screenshots and stuff like that or some links to uh, useful uh, sites or useful pages or articles and so on. So it's more conversational than just uh, one side contributes and the other side um, consumes the content. Chris? Thanks, Tamar. Um, that's great news. Uh, what's the next? Uh, so the next question is, what's the best way to manip manipulate search results in SharePoint 2013? Is there still best best function? Can we use metadata to promote results? Uh, interesting enough, as a as an aside, um, search still tends to be the single biggest reason people want to increase their intranet capabilities. Um, that in the cafeteria menu for some funny reason. But anyway, search is really really high on the list with everybody's priorities. So Tamar. Yeah, I mean, search is definitely one of the biggest um, or one of the most common functionality in any intranet. In fact, it's not all the intranet. Um, and search traditionally in SharePoint was uh, uh, probably a, a problematic, uh, uh, a problematic uh, piece of, uh, of, of, of component in SharePoint. Um, for those of you who already know how SharePoint 2007 and 2010, or if you did an upgrade from 2007 to 2010, you know that there's a search, the fast search, which used to be a fully separate component in 2007, and then in 2010 they added in, added it into SharePoint 2010 Enterprise uh, uh, product. Uh, but in addition to that, there's still that fast component that can be installed separately and then you have to connect it to SharePoint 2010 and and it can be a really messy and um, uh, complicated process. In 2013 they actually made the search a lot easier, a lot better to configure and install and they moved away from all the confusion that comes along with 2010. So now it's part of the SharePoint uh, product itself, it's not called FAST anymore, so when you go to 2013, there's no mention of FAST, but, you know, the, the, the engine itself is built on FAST, so nothing has changed, uh, or the engine hasn't changed, but what really changed in SharePoint 2010 is the configuration of the search. It's a lot easier, a lot more streamlined, a lot more isolated uh, than before. Again, in 2010, there's um, a lot of common areas for search where there's, there's only one place where you can define your schema and your finals and so on. Now every site collection can have its own schema or derivative schema from the original schema. Yeah, one of the really good additions to search in 2015 is the concept of query rules, which uh, eliminated the need for search scope. And search scope was a good feature in 2010, but it wasn't really, uh, I would say, uh, complete. Uh, it was very limited. There's lots of issues with it. The query rules in 2013 is really robust, and it's very, um, it's a very good uh, functionality in SharePoint 2013. And actually, what you see here on the slide right now, this is an example of how we leverage the query rules in implementing a very user-friendly and, uh, um, I would say, very functional search. Uh, and I, actually, we use that in our internet internally, where it's not just the search box. You can have, uh, you know, drop-downs. You can have filters and stuff like that that works with the search. So basically, we're not building everything from scratch. You're still leveraging a lot of the stuff in SharePoint 2015. You're amending the functionality with still a lot of these stuff uh, you know, it doesn't require a lot of customization, but you can have, uh, you know, different filters and so on, so you're adding dimension, more depth to the search result itself. Um, in, in addition to that, you, there, there's uh, additional functionality such as you can uh, specify on each specific list if you want it to be indexed or not, what columns you want to be indexed and so on. And then uh, one of the nice stuff in SharePoint 2013 is the out-of-the-box list view, which shows um, the list items for any list. Now it contains a search box by default, so basically you can uh, leverage that functionality also within SharePoint. All right, thanks, Tamar. Um, 
Yeah. And as you might have guessed, we were actually kind of uh, trying to cover off the major areas here. There, there were a lot of questions that came in, a lot of them very, very similar and specific. Uh, like I said, if we don't get to your question today, we will make sure we answer it and uh, email you back an answer. Um, we're trying to cover off as many different areas as possible. Um, the next uh, category is content, and the question comes, kind of comes under templates. So I'd like to know more about templates in SharePoint as we would like to set up a template to share lessons learned so users can click on it, fill in, and uh, most and post preferable as a word blog post, um, multi-document upload, and DCM, ECM content types, so those types of things. So can you tell us a little bit more, Tamara, about the, the new features as far as content? Yeah, sure. So, uh, in terms of templates in SharePoint 2013, there's not a lot of uh, additions uh, over 2010. Uh, so, the, the site templates, list templates, uh, content types, and so on, uh, they haven't been uh, that different from 2010. Uh, now, in, the, in, in terms of one, one of the things that have been added to SharePoint 2013 is the multi-document upload. Uh, we're now ensure in 2013 you can upload more than one document uh, at the same time or more than one file at the same time. And also drag and drop, which is a very easy way uh, uh, in uploading files. So you can just drag any file from your desktop into uh, the browser um, and that will work fine. You can drag multiple files. Uh, also, uh, there was a question, I guess, about around DCM or ECM and content types like um, uh, Dublin Core metadata and uh, enterprise content metadata and so on. So traditionally, again, SharePoint, I, I would say probably since 2007, uh, they've been very good in terms of providing flexibility uh, for metadata and content types, so you can create any content type uh, and then propagate that or publish that across the whole internet. Uh, DCM and ECM actually have been part of SharePoint out of the box content types, so you can definitely leverage these uh, metadata. But if you have any other metadata, if there's a metadata for your own organization, you can also uh, define those metadata and publish them across uh, across the form and uh, leverage. Uh, the metadata across uh, all sites. All right, thanks very much, Tamar. Um, uh, and moving on to a different category now, I had a question about integration, uh, and it covers quite a few. Actually, there's more than one question here, so I'll try and summarize them uh, quickly. But uh, the general idea is how easily can I SharePoint integrate to MYOB, Dynamics, CRM2? How do you manage document control? In other words, stopping someone from editing, deleting an attached file? And what are the best reporting tools on SharePoint? Um, so kind of a couple questions there. So why don't we take them uh, one at a time, Tamara, the, as far yeah. as integrating first and then maybe answer the question about reporting tools afterwards. Yeah, sure. So um, integration in SharePoint, uh, SharePoint 2010 and SharePoint 2013, they both have um, uh, the, the updated module over 2007, which is the BDC module. BDC allows, uh, allows you to integrate SharePoint with any external system. Uh, by default, the, uh, the BDC in, in 2015 uh, comes with uh, a couple of modules that you can use right out, right out of the box. You can uh, integrate with SQL or you can integrate with, uh, with uh, a web API or a, or a web service. <coughs> and in 2015, you can also integrate with OData or o, uh, with OData uh, and REST API. Um, so again, in terms of the integration with specific uh, packages such as Dynamic CRM, so Dynamic CRM, since it's a Microsoft product, they actually there's actually a, a connector or it's actually a product that can be installed which integrates Dynamic CRM with SharePoint without and without any addition, without any customization. So that's already there. My OB, I believe that's an accounting package. Um, so my my OB or, um, um, or or Dynamics AS that's another accounting package or SAP or all the other packages ARP packages or accounting packages and so on. Uh, there's many ways of integration. If if you can connect to the database, whether through ODBC or through any other connector, 
and you can integrate that system with SharePoint uh, through the BDC. If you can, if the package has an API, a web service API, or RESTful API, and so on, or, or data API, then you can also connect very easily to SharePoint. And in some cases, um, I would say in, in many cases, uh, you wouldn't need to add any custom code as long as uh, you built it up correctly in SharePoint and you have the right schema and everything. In some cases, you may need additional code or customized, customized code or third-party component that integrates with uh, whatever package you're trying to integrate with. So lots of ways, very, very flexible ways of integration. If you, you know, in, if you really want to go down into uh, more complex and complicated integration, you can do that with code. Uh, and, it, and it's also very secure, so all security and permissions and everything applies to, once you have the integration in, it applies to the data that's coming in or going out. Uh, in addition to that, in 2013, one of the really nice features is the ability to do what is called uh, an event listener or event receiver on external list. And so th that feature actually exists in SharePoint 2010, but only on internal list, which means only on internal data of SharePoint, where SharePoint stores and manages the data. But for external list that hasn't been there, and it was one of the really um, demanded, one of the demanded features in SharePoint 2010, now it exists in 2013. And what that allows you to do is you can build up um, events based on operations uh, made on external data. Uh, so there's lots of possibilities for what this functionality can do in terms of uh, in terms of implementation. Well, thanks, Tamar. Uh, the next category falls under hosting. There was a question on advice for SharePoint 2010 on promise. Ver on Premise. premise. <laughs> Not promise. <laughs> Lots of promises. Um, uh, uh, moving to a hosted 2013 intranet, uh, Office 365 or Azure or hybrid. Um, so why don't we chat a little bit about that for now? So, yeah, so I mean, this is really a, a, a common question. Uh, we, we have uh, retreats from this question uh, with many clients and faced with that even before I joined FBI and Cassian. Um, especially with the rise of cloud and uh, cloud computing and um, cloud services and so on. And then Office 365 was deployed a few years back and then there was so much hype around it. So let me just, uh, let, me tr let me try to break it down. So there's basically three things here we need to talk about. There's the on-prem, SharePoint on-premise, whether it's 2010 or 2014. And, uh, hosted SharePoint, uh, and that's just hosted on a cloud. Uh, so that's not Office 365. And then there's the Office 365, uh, which is basically a multi-tenant service provider. So, uh, so let's start with Office 365. So Office 365, as most of you know, is a Microsoft uh, service that's, uh, that provides organization and individual to host their own um, deployment of SharePoint, whatever SharePoint, uh, whether it's 2010 or 2013, I think, I believe right now they migrated to 2013. Uh, and it's a multi-tenant environment, meaning that it's, uh, it's, a, it's one service for all. And there's lots of limitations on that service, obviously, because it's a multi-tenant environment. So, um, security, for example, and authentication, there's some limitations there. There's also limitations in terms of what sites can be provisioned, uh, what solutions can be installed, and so on and so forth. So, from, uh, I guess, from functional perspective, there's, uh, there's definitely limitations in terms of functionality. From IT perspective, there's a lot of implementation. Uh, so that's the drawback. The good news is uh, you don't have to worry about upgrades, you don't have to worry about the uh, operations and so on. Uh, and uh, you know, it's, um, uh, 
is a whole team that takes care of these services and patching the services and securing the services and so on. Now, the bad news, as I mentioned, the limitations on functional and technical limitations, but also uh, it's very expensive. So again, if if your organization is few people, like a small um, a small startup or a small organization, uh, or few, uh, you know, between 10 to 50 people, I, I would assume, would be considered small, then maybe that will that'll justify uh, going into Office 365 as long as you know the limitations they're going to be faced with. Uh, the other reason for many of the companies going into Office 365 is uh, if you don't have an IT person or IT team, that I can take care of the servers and so on, and if, if you may, uh, it would uh, it would be I guess it would be more reasonable to go into Office 365. Uh, but if you really want to get um, if you want to get close functionality to the full functionality of SharePoint 2013, you will have to go with the highest plan, which is E3, I believe, and that costs twenty dollars a month per user. So if you have, and that, this 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 price is, is the listing price or the advertised price. Obviously, there's you know, believe it or not, Microsoft negotiates. So if you you have users or if you, if if you have agreement with with Microsoft, you can negotiate the price down and depends depends on how your relationship with the Microsoft folks and so on. So again, if we just use the list price of twenty dollars, if you have fifty users. So they, you're gonna pay um, what, like uh, $1,000 a month? Yeah. So you're gonna pay $1,000 a month in licensing. Uh, so you can see that this is not gonna fit an organization of uh, you know maybe 5,000 users or 10,000 users uh, because you're gonna spend a lot more uh, money on on licensing per month than if you um, if you have a different option. So that's Office 365. Uh, On-premise or hosted on the cloud, they're very similar. The, the only difference is you don't, in on-premise, you own your hardware, and you're responsible for refreshing the hardware and uh, hardening the hardware and everything. Uh, cloud or hosted on a cloud, such as Amazon or, uh, or uh, Rackspace or Google, <coughs> You don't own the hardware; it's all virtualized. Uh, you own you, even the operating system. In some cases, you don't own that. You own anything above the operating system. So, so what is what does that mean? What it means is, in, a, in an organization with a um, thin IT team, probably cloud computing will make a lot more sense. Because now you don't have to worry about refreshing hardware or hardening hardware or hardening the operating system and so on. Um, you will pay a little bit more. Obviously, it, uh, it's a uh, OpEx model or, uh, as opposed to CapEx model when you do on premise. So you're going to be paying a monthly subscription or monthly fee for the services that provided uh, on premise. You're investing into um, uh, your hardware, and you're going to have to. You're going to need an IT team that is capable of uh, handling and managing this hardware. Uh, so again, in in this, I guess in this day and age, I guess um, going on the cloud makes a lot more sense for medium-sized organization. Uh, bigger size organization uh, such as banks and uh, insurance companies and healthcare and so on, especially when data protection is really important and there's lots of audit and lots of prescriptions and so on, on premise will make a lot more sense. Right, thanks, Tamar. A um, couple more questions here. Uh, we've got one about a custom web part. Is there a SharePoint web part for polling that you can recommend? So. Um, uh, if you look around in SharePoint, and it hasn't really changed in 2013, if you look around for anything that provides polling, you will see a lot of TechNet articles or a lot of TechNet uh, questions and answers around that issue. And uh, Microsoft 
answer to that would be sure it's there. It's uh, it's a survey, a quality survey. So there's a survey uh, list in SharePoint. You can leverage that and create a poll. Now, in practice, uh, it doesn't really work that well because uh, surveys in SharePoint, you're going to have to create a, a new list for every survey, and then it, it can get really messy. Um, you know, um, lots of clients, when they start using it, they will abandon it right away. So what we do, there's many ways. Uh, there's lots of uh, solutions out there. But what we actually did uh, at Prescient, we uh, customized a custom list in SharePoint. And actually, if you want to show this uh, screenshot, it's uh, so there's, uh, we customize one of the lists uh, in SharePoint, uh, and which provides full functionality. Um, I guess we don't have the screenshot, so that's fine. Uh, so yeah, that's going. So <coughs> so yeah, we uh, so this. List is customized to provide a poll uh, or poll, and you can create multiple polls. You can go back and forth into polls. You can, um, uh, you know, you can obviously when any user hits a poll, they can answer the poll. They can view the results. They can view previous results and so on. And that that all can be done um, without any custom poll. And that's actually what's done here. Uh, so again, if you um, you know, if, if you're willing to do some implementation without going too much into coding and so on, that can be done on, on, on SharePoint. Uh, if you're more comfortable with uh, third-party solutions, there's lots of SharePoint uh, solutions out there. Hey, thanks, Tamar. Um, there's a question that came in online, uh, which I'm going to throw at Tamar now, unbeknownst. <laughs> anyway, was, uh, regarding a British SharePoint expert, I won't name names here. It says there's little out of the box that works well on mobile devices. What are your uh, views of mobile, which is a business requirement for many organizations? Of course, organizations spell with an S because it's a British question, obviously. Um, I want to I want to first preface that by putting up uh, this particular slide. Uh, we did a recent SharePoint 2013 implementation. Um, and I, I guess the question is, there's little that works out of the box. And, and I, I would want to understand from the SharePoint expert what, what they mean by out of the box. Uh, a typical implementation or our methodology at uh, Prescian includes doing a lot of customization in those first two top parts of the triangle, which is what we consider out of the box customization, and then and the Microsoft Office tools and third party components. So we don't really consider those complete customization. Uh, until you get to lines of code. Uh, so you can see from the diagram on the right, this is actually an example from a recent uh, implementation we did for a customer. Actual lines of code in Visual Studio was truly only 3% of the implementation. So the top two parts we would, we would consider more customization than creation of, of code, which as most of you know would have to get changed if there's going to be another future update or reinvented again. So I guess, Tamara, if you could add to that um, for mobile, specifically for SharePoint 2013, because we've had great success with it. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so in terms of the slide, so one of the main issues that we always face uh, when when we go into an engagement with a client, uh, especially when it comes to upgrade, uh, if you have custom solutions, which is mainly built in Visual Studio, and you're trying to upgrade from 2007 to 2010 or 2010 to 2015 and so on. The custom solutions you you will face with will face with a lot of challenges in upgrading these custom solutions to the next version of SharePoint, and a lot of the time and investment will be spent on upgrading these solutions. In fact, probably. Uh, between upgrading applications or solutions and containerization, a lot of your uh, budget will go into those particular areas. Uh, so what we try to do here is minimize that pain so that when you upgrade to the next uh, version of SharePoint, uh, in, in most cases, it will be smooth upgrade or you have to just upgrade uh, the platform itself and everything else will uh, Will be upgraded automatically. Now, in terms of mobile, uh, mobile on SharePoint. Uh, so again, out of the box, traditionally SharePoint, <coughs> starting from 2010, uh, they kind of 
split the experience or the user experience into two. So there is the desktop user experience and mobile user experience. So if you uh, if you go on a SharePoint deployment that is hasn't been customized on desktop, you're going to see um, you know the, uh, the the typical UI of SharePoint. And if you use a mobile, you're going to see a totally different UI, which doesn't really provide a lot of functionality. And then you have to you you have to cut or you have to configure what is available on mobile and so on. Uh, what we've done at Pressing is we leverage the reactive design for every deployment we, we, we take on. So basically, it's one design, one interface, one user experience, but it reacts to uh, the environment that is accessed by. So if, the, if it's a desktop environment, it's going to have the full UI. If it's a mobile environment, it's going to scale it down or we'll remove some components or we'll reorder some components and then the uh, the branding will still remain the same. Uh, the, the functionality will remain the same. Uh, this typically, again, SharePoint has some limitations in terms of uh, what can be done on mobile. So that that is removed. Uh, we can remove that uh, uh, as part of the reactive design itself. But then uh, in the end, when a user goes on mobile, the, uh, the branding will remain the same. Most of the functionality is the same. Where, uh, but the UI itself will adapt to the uh, mobile uh, device. Yeah, thanks, Emma. Um We did promise everybody kind of a 45-minute Q&A. We've got a couple more questions we'll take uh, just for the end here. Uh, actually, I just saw another interesting one pop up online, which we'll, we'll, we'll run over to because I think this is a, uh, this is really neat in the new SharePoint 2013. Uh, it, the question is, does SharePoint have any plans to improve how users work on documents together? Um, are there any improvements to the UI, uh, much like Google Docs? Um, I, my personal experience, and we've got, we still, full disclosure, we actually have SharePoint 2013 implemented in-house. Uh, it's really great. We work on uh, documents together all the time. You can see who, when the other person is working on a specific piece of the document. I guess, Tamara, if you can expand upon the granularity of the security when working with different types of documents, that'd be great for our audience. Yeah, so um, SharePoint 2013 and same thing in 2010, with a little bit more improvements in 2013 over 2010. Uh, so you can do a, what is called a co-authoring. Uh, so if you're working on a Word document, uh, you can have multiple users working on the same Word document. And then uh, if five people are working on the same Word document, you can see exactly who is working on which paragraph. So it actually locks the paragraph for whoever is working on that section of the Word document. And then uh, you know, you can see at the, uh, at the bottom of Word, you can see uh, in the status bar, you can see who is working uh, on that document. So if there's five people there, you can see who those five people are. So Word document works really well. Uh, PowerPoint, uh, I, I, I believe it locks the, or the locking is on the slide level. So if I'm working on one slide and uh, the other person on the other slide, but not the slide I'm working on. Excel is a little bit, tricky. Uh, what, uh, if you use the web browser's Excel, uh, then you can, uh, the locking is on the cells uh, level, which is very similar to Google Docs, where you can make changes on one cell, another person makes changes on a different cell, and so on. As long as all users use the uh, Office web app or the browser's version of Excel. And that's very similar to Google Docs. The only limitation is if someone opens up the file in Excel application, then it locks the whole file. And uh, there's lots of reasons around that. I won't get into those reasons now, but uh, it, it, you know, by design, it, uh, it cannot, it cannot work unless everyone works on on the online version. So again, if you compare SharePoint to Google Docs, um, almost. I guess everything that is available in Google Docs is available in SharePoint, as long as you use the online version of Office in SharePoint, which is the Office Web App. In addition to Google Docs, there's lots more, lot, a lot more functionality that's available in SharePoint. All right, thanks, Tamara. As I mentioned before, we uh, self full disclosure, we you do use SharePoint 2013 internally, and yes, we're having uh, great success with it for sharing documents. So, good question. Uh, one final question here before we have a, a couple of slides just to close out today's webinar. 
Um, and it has to do with upgrading to SharePoint 2013 from 2010, from Jive, from other CMSs, from nothing. <laughs> so generically, what's you know a couple of a lot of questions about well, how do I upgrade and what do I what do I do or what do I need to know about for an, from an upgrade perspective if I don't have 2013? Okay, so um, yeah, I've seen a couple of questions around uh, upgrade and migration. So. Uh, Jive, if, if you're familiar with Jive, Jive is more like um, a, a social um, or a social provider than an internet provider. It's very similar to Yammer. So basically, it provides some chance such as conversations and um, you know, discussions and so on. So lots of uh, social aspects in, 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 in Jive. And Yammer it will probably be the competitor to Jive in that space. Um, another comparison in that space is uh, Newsgator. So these three are very similar, but they're not. They don't substitute for SharePoint. They they can be added to SharePoint because they don't really provide lots of other stuff that SharePoint does. So SharePoint as a platform, there's lots more than just social access, social uh, feature. Uh, and in fact, as we've seen some clients who actually implement or integrate Jive with SharePoint. So they can coexist, but you can substitute SharePoint for Jive. And now the upgrade from Jive to SharePoint, uh, I wouldn't consider upgrading Jive to SharePoint 2010, because SharePoint 2010 does not have any social capabilities or very primitive uh, at, uh, social capabilities existing in 2010. I would uh, consider upgrading Jive to 2013, or 2010 plus another add-on such as Newsgator. 2013, um, in terms of uh, whether you need Newsgator or not, that's really uh, something that needs to be answered maybe in the planning or assessment phase. Lots of functionalities now that used to exist in Newsgator now exist in 2013. The other, uh, the other, um, I guess, the other uh, vendor is Yammer. So Yammer has lots of functionality that uh, Jive or Nidgear have. Now the story with Yammer, now you have to be really careful around Yammer because Yammer is provided as a service. It's a software as a service. You cannot install Yammer on uh, cloud or on premise. So <coughs> none of the data exists on your data center and you don't have control over the data. And when you integrate Yammer with uh, on-premise SharePoint or on the cloud SharePoint, except Office 365, when you integrate it with your SharePoint deployment, you kind of use uh, like there's some web that just give you a, a read-only or view-only um, uh, view of Yammer. So not, it, it, the integration is very primitive, very rudimentary at this point. And again, um, it requires so the nature of Yammer by design it requires internet connection uh, for every user who is going to access that feature on SharePoint, and that can that that could be a very um, a major limitation in a lot of internet because in a lot of internet you don't really have access to the internet. Um, now, in terms of migration, uh, uh, content migration, there's lots of uh, packages out there that provide content migration, but again, you have to be very careful around selecting the content migration uh, tools because uh, every client is different and every scenario is different, and uh, you can't just don't you can't expect you're going to buy a tool, spend a hundred thousand dollars or more on those content migration tools, and expect the migration to happen just by a click of a button. There's lots of stuff that goes into content migration, so planning and assessment is really important before you decide anything. Good. All right, thanks very much, and we've just a couple of uh, cleanup slides as we uh, the, we end the webinar here. That was great. We certainly appreciate your your viewpoints, um, Tamara. Um, so, hang on one second. I uh, wanted to show you really quickly when the next webinar is, uh, next month on September 12th. Uh, again, if you like today's or you uh, submitted a question today, next month is going to be on a specific SharePoint 2013 social internet case study.
So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have that online and we'll show our 2013 implementation and uh, how they implemented their social intranet. Um, also want to show you, uh, again as a reminder, the Intranet Global Forum that uh, Prescient hosts every year in New York City. We're actually doing uh, two or three this year, so the, uh, they haven't been formally announced, but there will be other locations worldwide. Um, probably one on the West Coast and maybe one over in Europe also. Not formally announced yet, but just uh, on the radar. But again, uh, 2013, uh, the one for this year is uh, in New York City, October 24th and 25th, and we'd love to see you down there. Sign up is on our website, or I believe it's also on the IABC website, too. You'll be able to find that information. So, Again, here's my contact information. I'm an easy guy to find, Chris Chambers and uh, there's Tamar, uh, both over at Prescient and Social Business Interactive, which is, again, a, uh, our implementation division of, of Prescient. And thank you very much.